Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this afternoon's seminar. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Rob. I am the Operations Director um, for Quinnage Limited. Um, on the call, we also have Craig, um, who is currently muted, but um, Craig is the founder and CEO of Quinnergy. Um, so we're due to kick off in a couple of minutes, folks. Um, so we'll get started in just a minute. We'll give um, we've got a few other people that have registered that aren't with us yet. Um, order for today, really, we'll just um, a quick overview of um, you know the Housing Scotland Act and the amendments that we're discussing today specifically. Um, won't spend too much time on that. I think most people here will have a, a good knowledge of uh, the repair and standard and what's you know what what's coming in with the amendments um and then we'll go in a little bit more detail about um lead testing um and the rcd requirements for the new legislation which comes into force from the first of march um if you have any questions um i think um you should have a way of putting um your hand up and we'll come to you um during the natural breaks um, alternatively, you can just put a message um, in the chat there, like Craig has done, and we will come back to you. Um, please bear with us. This is new software for us for the webinar, um, so there may be a few technical issues, um, but I'm sure we'll get through it just fine. Um, I just want to check, first of all, um, can everyone hear me okay? Um, if you could just give us a quick okay or hi in the chat, that would be great. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Excellent. Perfect. Well, again, welcome for those who have, have just joined. Um, so let's just jump in. I'm going to share my screen just so we can um, have a, a look at um, some of the legislation and stuff. Um, and essentially, you know, why, why are we here? What's happening? What's caused this? Um, essentially, what's coming into force um, is an amendment to the 2006 Repairing Standard and um, that was introduced by uh, the Scottish government, obviously, back in 2006. Um, and that essentially, in, in a basic nutshell, covers all tenancies in Scotland, um, which exceed 31 days. Um, you know, it's all encompassing, basically, if you're in a property for cost, or, um, you, you are covered by repair and standard. Um, this is it here. Um, I think most people, as I say, on the call will be aware of it, so we don't tend to spend too much time on it. Um, but yeah, essentially, this is this is what it is. Um, so this is repair and standard. Um, it is a statutory guide. It is a legal requirement, um, and as I said, it applies from the first of March two thousand and four to to all tenancies and rent properties in in Scotland. Um, again, the the full guidance is, is available on the Scottish Government website. It's actually a really good resource um, and it's quite um, quite a good idea to to get to know it, essentially, if you're renting properties or involved in that. As I say, I think most people that I'm aware of in here have a pretty good grasp of it. Um, so what we're talking about today, obviously, first of all, uh, lead testing. Now, obviously, this has been in consultation with the Scottish Government for quite a long time. Um, it was announced last year um, and obviously a year to, to implement. Um, however, there has been um, a little bit of, well, quite a few changes back and forth within the actual legislation itself. Um, but the part of the legislation in terms of that's affecting the lead testing and why we are now looking at doing lead testing um, is, is the Annex 5, uh, Annex 5 uh, D5 installations for sanitation, D.97 installations for sanitation. Um, and essentially, it's that first point there, sink provider satisfactory supply of both hot and cold water for food preparation, cleaning and cooking utensils. This, in essence, is why the testing has changed a little bit um, in terms of there was communication previously through different organisations that you would have to test certain points within the property. Um, where we stand at the moment is that there will be one test supplied from the kitchen sink. Um, and in essence, that is sufficient um, to show that your um, lead levels in your water meet the requirement. And um, we'll come on to the requirement in, 
in just a second. Um, but essentially, that's that's where that that's come from. Um, so how do we how do we know a property has lead, um, and if it meets the requirement? So there's a few ways that we can do this. Essentially, um, the only really robust way that um, the most housing organisations are, are agreeing on is is the lead testing. Um, now I think the general consensus has changed within the last few weeks um, from somewhere well from five um, micrograms per liter um, up to ten micrograms per liter. So why has that happened? Well, in, in essence, Scottish Water uh, basically state that if you have higher than five micrograms per liter um, they will make steps in a dwelling for the piping that they're responsible for to change that. Um, however, the legal tolerable limit for lead in water um, is 10 micrograms. And that's the general consensus of what's been agreed on at the moment is that if your lead testing is below 10 micrograms per liter, then it is deemed safe. Um, and again, I think realistically, there's there's been lots of discussions about how we're you know we're going to implement this and how we're going to ensure that we can prove we've taken reasonable steps, and that we are providing the satisfactory supply of both hot and cold water, um, and that's where the the general um, operating procedure at the moment is that one test from the kitchen tap will be taken. Um, so there's lots of issues surrounding that, essentially, um, when it comes to tenements, private dwellings, who owns what, what can be done. Um, in essence, reasonable steps to ensure that if you do have a, a lead test over 10 micrograms per litre, you take reasonable steps to, to reduce that um, and limit the, the harm that that lead um, could cause to your potential tenants. So lab testing, essentially what we what we do as a company um, and what we would recommend is that the water to be unused within the property for 12 hours prior to the test. And um, this is to make sure that um, in general day to day usage of your property, it, it's more than reasonable that as tenants go to bed or go out the property for the day, there could be periods of time where that water sits um, sits in the property and is not used. Uh, the longer the water is in contact with the lead, obviously, higher the lead samples and um, so that's why a sample is taken we come into difficulty with that obviously with flats and tenements because we can't stop people in the rest of the building using the lead um, and it's actually the most likely point of contact for lead piping is, is going to be within the old dwelling tenements um, within the property so that's um, obviously a, an issue but it is one that's out with your control so that's a, a reasonable step um, visual inspection um, of your property and, in fact, the, the mains water within the property. So that'll probably be roof spaces in the old tenements. Um, there could be lead tanks up in the roof, roof space as well that would, would be an issue. Um, and essentially, to identify lead, as lead ages, it does get more difficult to identify. Um, scraping the pipe will tell you quite quickly if it's shiny and silver, that's lead. Um, it's non-magnetic to lead pipe, so um, magnets don't really work. Um, if the lead obviously scraped as copper, then it's a copper pipe and it would be deemed safe. Um, plastic is in fair regular use now and obviously quite easily identifiable, um, so that's one way. The other way, obviously, other than doing a lab test is, is Scottish Water. So Scottish Water will come out to your property um, and they will test your property for free. This the the feedback we're getting from lots and lots of different sources now, um, as demand for this starts to grow, um, is, is throwing up a lot of issues. So, has to be arranged by the tenant. And um, Scottish Water will not deal with you as a letting agent or as the property owner, and um, they will only deal with the tenant. Tenants generally not really too concerned about doing this, so it's not a, a priority for them. Um, however, obviously for you as a property owner, a property manager. It's a legal requirement, so there's a, a big discrepancy and an urgency there. And with the huge demand, the, the backlogs for Scottish Water are growing, and we're hearing up to ten to twelve weeks now with lots of cancellations and engineering issues. And so, you know that that will that will get exasperated even further over the next um, six to eight weeks. So we expect that to to get worse. Um, and then obviously private companies like such as ourselves, Queen Energy, to go out and, and do testing. Um, we are anticipating um, a significant amount of um, testing that's going to be required to be done over the next few months. 
Um, obviously, we we are geared up for it. Um, but yeah, just bear in mind that even for ourselves dealing with the labs, these tests will um, test results will take longer and longer. Um, and regardless of how big we are, we only have a certain amount of capacity. So time really is of the essence with these things um, to kind of decide what your course of action is as the the manager or owner of uh, a private a private property. So the next stage, I guess, is really to talk about is you've done your lead test and you've come in at 12, 14, 15, 20 micrograms per litre. Um, what can you do? So again, part, a, lot, part, a big part of that is reasonable steps that you can take. Um, now, again, part of the issue you're going to come across is, especially with flats or tenements um, or communal water supplies into the property, um, you as a property owner of maybe one or possibly two flats um, would not be reasonably expected to cover the cost of the whole um, water replacement of a lead pipe. That would be deemed, I would say, as uh, not necessary or, or not reasonable even. Um, however, you do still have a duty to do everything that is reasonable. Um, so that potentially would include um, replacing any lead piping within your property. You can also speak to um, Scottish Water um, in relation to what they will offer. Um, and we'll just have a, a look at um, what Scottish Water is legally responsible for. Um, excuse the word painting, but it's the clearest way I could find of showing you this. Um, and it does show it quite clearly. This is available on the Scottish website, the Scottish Water website. Um, and essentially, Scottish Water is responsible for any piping up to the external stopcock of your property, which is normally found in the street. Um, generally not found on your private property. Um, however, it can be, but mostly you'll find that out on the street for whether, regardless of whether it's a flat or tenement or your, your own house um, or private house, sorry. Um, you will find it there. Basically, anything past that um, communication pipe into the water supply or the pipe internal pipe work of your property is is your legal responsibility or that of the um, collective of the building. Um, so, what we would basically advise in that instance is that if your um, lead is above ten milligrams, uh, sorry micrograms, in essence, contact Scottish Water. Um, they will probably be able to tell you quite quickly whether the water main and the communication pipe outside your property has recently been replaced um, after 1970. Um, and if so, then you would probably have to take some other action um, to rectify the lead content within the property. So coming on to the 1970, essentially um, in 1969, uh, lead piping for water was was basically banned by a, an upgrade to the building standards back then. So there should be no lead piping in properties um, after 1969. Um, we would advise looking at any properties up to 1975 purely for the reason that um, not just lead piping, um, but other products containing lead such as water tanks um, as well would, would be an issue. Um, so looking a little bit closer, anything from 1970 to 1975 would be um, a good idea. Um, but I think most people are accepting that and they are only going to test properties after 1969 or 1970, which would be fair in that instance. Um, so as I said, if you have, if you have a, a test that is above um, 10 micrograms per litre, and um, the mitigations that you can take would be changing the lead within your property, asking Scottish Water, first of all, to change the lead outside the property. And if they can do that, then you can retest the property once that work has been complete and hope that the micrograms per litre come below the 10 mark. Um, however, if you've done both of those things and you are still getting high readings, um, then you would need to take other reasonable action. And that at that stage, that's when you look at replacing the pipework within the property um, and potentially I think you would probably reasonably be expected to look at whether changing the pipework if there was lead within the remainder of the building seeing if that would be feasible um, and just proving you know that you have tried to do that and I think in very few cases that would be a, a realistic option 
Um, but again, it's more about proving you've taken that, that reasonable step to, to do that. So lead, lead testing, as I said, is a one litre bottle of water taken from the main kitchen tap within the property. And that is then sent to a lab. And a government, we're using a government approved lab, a Scottish government approved lab. Um, and they test that. Test results at the moment are taking about three to four weeks. Um, however, um, we do expect that to probably double and if not triple come in, in a few months as more and more um, lead testing has been, has been done. Um, and in, in essence, that's that's where we're up to at the moment um, with lead testing. Um, does anyone at the moment have any specific questions that they would like to would like to ask? So I can see a couple of people right here. So we'll just wait for them. So a visual check, um, a visual check would uh, I would say is would not be deemed um, sufficient um, to ascertain whether the lead content with the property. Um, the reason for that is that if you think about the majority of renovations that have happened in properties over 1970 will be to the actual internal property itself. At that stage, it's highly likely those lead tests, those lead pipes would have been changed. Um, now, if you're certain that there is lead within the property, then you you don't definitely have to change. The, the legislation doesn't say you have to remove lead testing, essentially. It means that you have to prove that the water is safe, and you can do that by ensuring that the lead content in the property is below 10 micrograms. So in essence, technically, you could have lead in your property, but prove that your, lead, your results are under 10 micrograms per litre. Um, However, I would ask, I would I would advise that if there's definitely lead there, you would um, you would be required to change that. I, I don't think it would be um, reasonable to find lead and, and not and not change it. Um, but in terms of just using a visual check, um, there have been a lot of conversations about this, and um, I don't think it would be deemed reasonable to to just do a visual check, find no lead, and say there's no lead in my property. It's it's safe. Um, and again, it comes back to that reasonable check. Um, okay, uh, what lab are we using? So we're using all the government scientific labs in Edinburgh, Glasgow, um, predominantly for for the lead within uh, lead testing. Um, so yeah. Who is monitoring this and how? Um, so it's the same with anything else um, in relation to that. Tenants can make complaints to the first tier tribunal and your local council. Um, if you have done nothing and they're aware you've done nothing, then they can complain um, and ask you to prove how you have, how you are, prove you're providing them with a satisfactory supply of both hot and cold water. Um, and obviously, where I think everyone's probably quite aware of. Um, how the first tier uh, tribunal in Scotland works and what the ramifications of of not being up to a legal standard um, or the required standard as per the repairing standards. So um, the bar would be the exact same with with lead testing um, on that. Uh, Scottish Water called on my tenants asked into the visual check and they confirmed pipes were okay and do not need to attend. I spoke to Scottish Association of Landlords about this and they said this would not be accepted and SW need to attend for the rest test to be carried out and the lab report to be issued. So yeah, that's absolutely correct. Again, um, what we're dealing with here and you, you know, Craig will come on, oh, I'll talk quickly about the EICRs and, and the RCD protection. What we're talking about here is the the legal requirement that Scottish Water work to with, with regards to uh, providing um, clean drinking water in Scotland is not necessarily on the same bar as would be held for a repairing standard. Um, so we're specifically looking at, you know, if, for example, you were taken to a first tier tribunal because there was lead found in the property um, and you know, there's nothing to stop your tenant having a, a lead check done off on their own accord in, in the future. Um, and if they find lead and you can't prove that you've you have tested sufficiently um and if 
It is a little bit of a grey area, but I think it's pretty clear that if you were to say we've only done, we did a visual check, we didn't find lead, I can't see in any way that um, the the first year tribunal would not think that would be reasonable. So there is a risk there that the tenant would have their own lead test done, find it to be above the legal limit, um, and and take action. And I, I don't think having a visual check of your properties would protect you sufficiently or be deemed as reasonable. Um, and yeah, as, as Laura says, it is a one-off test. This is not going to be an annual or biannual or five-yearly thing. Um, this is something we're going to have to go through. And ultimately, you know, 99% of checks that, that Scottish Water have done in previous years, um, tests have been found to be below the, the 10 micrograms. Um, so, you know, in terms of remedial action you may have to take, majority of these properties will potentially come back as as under the legal limit um, and of those properties the the work that you will actually have to do to, to be deemed to be reasonable um then you know i think the work you know the if you're we're thinking about repiping properties from top to bottom i mean i'm sure it's going to happen i'm sure there's there are going to be properties out there that it does happen but i think um being reasonably minded it's probably um Going to be few and far between it is just the initial cost of of having the the lead testing done which um you know i, I completely understand why landlords are where they are um so i just realized i'm still not sure i'm screen i'll come back to you for a second so i completely understand um to landlords why, why they are and property owners why they're so apprehensive and a bit frustrated by by these things um but unfortunately we are where we are with the scottish government i'm not going to get too political um but yeah, that is the law. So it is what it is. Uh, again, Warren, what happens if lead test shows lead and it cannot be lowered due to whatever reasons? Is there advice would be given to the tenant? Yes, brilliant question. I was actually coming on to. So thanks for that. If you have done everything reasonable, so there's, you've proved there's no lead in your property, you've asked Scottish Water to change the lead, there's lead in the building, you've been to the building, factors and other property owners if you have to, to say, look, there's lead in the property, this is what we should be doing, and you get a big no. Um, what we would recommend doing is that within the property, um, there would be advice given to tenants to run the tap for 30 seconds prior to um, putting that in. And as I said, Craig, Craig says there, there is a filter system that can be installed um, if needed. I think that the, the information coming from Sal Scottish Water is that um, tenants would be given notice that they must run their tap for 30 seconds prior to, to using the water, um, and that would be sufficient to um, to reduce that risk. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, in that instance. Um, so yeah, hopefully we've covered everything a little. Is there, unless anyone else any final questions on there that we want to cover? I'll just quickly cover off our pricing. Um, so if you're an existing client with us and we're doing a, and you have another cert required at your property, um, we do charge £60 plus VAT to carry out the lead testing. Um, if you are sending us only to the property to carry out lead testing, then it is £80 plus VAT um, per test. Um, we have done our level best to try and keep prices low um, because we know the timing um, in relation to this is not great for landlords and they are being squeezed and hopefully with the changes and um, with the rent system coming in things will get a little bit better um, although my finger hasn't necessarily been totally on the pulse with that but i think there is a big change coming there and um, so we have done our best to keep prices down the lab costs are the lab costs i think it's 36 pound plus that we pay so you know again our, our margins are pretty tight when you come into the fact of trying to arrange attendance to the property send an engine to the property we then have to arrange for the test to be kept in the fridge until it is does get to the prop uh, to the lab um and that has to be done within um 24 hours for our, our purposes um so it is quite involved it's not a yeah it's not an easy process for us uh, we are just in a situation where we can do these quickly in bulk um as a company i think we will potentially end up doing somewhere between five to eight thousand um but that could go up between eight to twelve thousand so um yeah there's there are a lot to be done in the next um three weeks 
<laughs> it's not going to get another three weeks. But um, yeah, I would say that this isn't something we want to be dragging out for a long time because, um, as you will probably know, should this be taken to a tribunal for non-payment of rent, et cetera, et cetera, this is just another thing that tenants can use um, against the, the landlord. So uh, we would recommend getting something in place and, and having this done as quickly as possible. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, cool. Everyone okay? Happy to move on to the um, interesting subject of EICRs and RCV protections. Um, so let me just get the... Cool. So, yeah, moving on. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to do a very brief overview and then I'll hand over to Craig, who is the electrical expert. Um, so the first thing that we have been notifying um, everyone on, because it's a lot, it is very misunderstood, having a current EICR does not satisfy the requirement of D.54 and the new legislation. So even though you may have had your EICR test to get done an hour ago, that does not necessarily mean that you are compliant with the new repairing standards. So that's what I was talking a little bit about before, that there are lots of different standards and there's legal standards and we have standards that we have to comply to um, from an electrical point of view, from a gas point of view. Um, it does, you know, the, the Repairing Scotland Act now is at a much higher level than you would be obviously prepared to have in your own home. Um, I personally have never done any ICR in my property. Um, I might get sure that I'm a bit quick. But... Um, you know, these are standards are much higher than we would um, anticipate um, from a, a general level. And again, that's why there was that little bit of toing and froing about the five micrograms and the 10 micrograms with the Scottish Water, Scottish Government, and the Scottish Association of Landlords, um, and why they have settled on the 10 micrograms. Um, so, this, this is kind of the same thing. Um, you know, the legal requirement in Scotland for a, a residential home is not the same as an EICR standard, they are different. Um, so the RCD protection is is a, is a different standard, and as I said, Craig will Craig will come on to that a little bit. Um, in a set. In fact, let's just um, let him talk now because I'm sure he's raring to go. Hello, hello. I can't believe you muted me for that long. I was actual itching to get on. I could see the eyes starting to burn to the back of my head, so I was like, "I'll we'll, we'll let him in there. He's, he's good." To us. Right. So. Um, Hi everyone, and thank you for kind of coming on. Um, I'll try and keep this kind of short and sweet, and kind of get to the point of what you need to take away from this one. So, as Rob was saying, you could have uh, an EICR um, that's deemed satisfactory, um, but it doesn't have RCD protection, um, which uh, is what the repairing standard is asking for nowadays. So I'll give us two seconds to make sure that, uh, so it's just popped up there. Um, so um, an EICR, when an, when an engineer is going out to do an EICR, they are actually doing testing and inspection um, on the addition that that installation was wired in. So if it was wired in 1980, it'd be um, tested to the 16th edition when there was no requirement for any RCD protection. Um, anything after that would have been the 17th edition up to 1993, I think it was, or 94, um, and there still wasn't a requirement for RCD protection. So when we go out, as long as there's been no alterations or there's anything wrong with that installation, that EICR can be passed because we are going to the standards of the addition that the, the property was, or the installation was installed in. Um, it's only when you start doing work to the installation, to the electrical installation, that you then need to bring up to today's standard. So today's standard is you do need RCD protection. So any kind of work that has been done um, will be brought to today's standard and should have RCD protection. So um, so if, we, if, we've got our, if you've got EICRs that have been done uh, in the last five years and have been passed, as we keep saying, that is not going to be um, correct for this new standard. Um, so the new standard is basically saying that there has to be a 30 milliamp RCD uh, residual device looking after at least one circuit in the property. Now, they are kind of saying that the minimum has to be a socket circuit. Um, but it's very, very vague and very, very grey. So if you have one RCD and your 
consumer unit, then you are okay to um, to go ahead. At, at you have the you have the overall uh, consent. That everything's all right. So um, I don't know if people know what an RCV is. So I've got a couple of old boards here. So just to put you in a picture here, I don't know if we can see us. So this one was actually tested and passed by us in 2023. And it has, so this is what you'd call a split load board, um, if you can see that. So on this side here, you've got the main switch, which is not RCD. This here effectively isolates and protects all these individual MCBs. And then here, you have the RCD device, which protects all of these circuits, and the majority of them will be sockets. So that how you determine it is you see that yellow button, and that's a test facility for testing this RCD, right? So that's one. Now, I don't know if you can see the details on it, but it says 30 milliamp, right? Um, I'm going to show you another. This is one from the late 80s, 90s, which, again, with the pass, it's up here, it's told us when it's been tested by the other engineer. And here it actually says, I don't know if you can kind of see that. Yeah. It says a hundred a hundred milliamps, right? So even though that that board or that installation is protected by an RCD, it's a hundred milliamp. So that is um not enough. It needs to be 30 milliamps. So that one wouldn't a pass or wouldn't be satisfactory for the new repairing standard that um and if you have a fuse box like this this was done probably 70s 80s which to be fair see if there was nothing wrong with this installation this would have passed now the reason this one failed is because it had this big massive hole in it and you could get your finger in it that is why it failed but this one is obviously as you can see fuse wire um so that EICR could have passed, but there's no RCD protection. So we now need to fit it. Um, so today's boards, what we do is the boards that we fit, um, I've actually got these devices in it. And this is basically a, uh, it's an MCB, which is a miniature circuit breaker, which is one of these. Um, so you could have an RCD protecting a line of these. And... Now what we do is we fit this in, so it's called an RCBO. So it's an MCB and an RCD combined. And it's got there, the V test facility, rather than having it on. So that means every individual circuit is RCD protected. So to get to the bottom of it, what would happen if your board doesn't have RCD protection? Well, there's a couple of scenarios here that the worst case scenario would be that we have to change a full consumer unit because there's other issues and we cannot retrofit one of these into the fuse box because the manufacturer doesn't uh, provide them. Or um, if you maybe look at here, now this was a kind of modern board. The reason we couldn't do it go any further is these breakers, they don't, there's, no, um, there's no buzz bar there. So what happens is these breakers actually clip in to, if you look right in there, there's a wee clip in buzz bar, they actually clip in. So these are specific for that type um, and you can't get parts for them anymore. Um, and same with the other couple. So taking out an MCB to fit an RCBO, so you do have like a single line of protection, can only be done if the manufacturer allows it or that you have space on the board. These are very expensive, right? But there is ones that are like this, that they, they take up two spaces. So if your board doesn't have the, enough space or facility for it, then that's when it's going down a, a board change. So Craig, um, just, to, just, so, just to rewind quickly, um, just to cover something off, you said earlier about um, just touching on the you may have an EICR for a property, um, but if, for example, we have to go back in and make changes to that circuit, can you discuss that just a, a little bit? A little bit more. Yeah. Um, so 
obviously going back to if to make changes then um you have to bring whatever the changes are and the rest of insulation up to today's standard so if there's been things that have been passed on it um which effectively mainly would be rcd protection and fire ratings and ip ratings um, you would have to bring the full installation up to that standard. So some of it is you could have surface mounted cable that's not been protected by trunking or again, if it's a lighting circuit and it's not got RCD protection, but it's surface mounted or you have surface mounted uh, switches, you have lamps that are open, like especially in bathrooms and kitchens, then you need to effectively replace all of them at the same time. Also, this board here, even though it had RCD protection, or just say, for instance, you can have these boards without RCD protection, but because this is plastic, um, it's de it's deemed non-fire rated, where if we had to replace a fuse inside there to put RCD protection to bring it up to today's standard, we would have to replace that fuse box as well because it's not fire rated. And today's standards is you cannot have a fuse box that's not fire rated. But on a, a previous EICR, this would have been only classed as a C3 for non-fire rated. So that's why majority of this will probably be full replacement for fuse box, unless you have a more up-to-date one that the manufacturer can supply these, or you're changing this main switch to an RCD main switch, or you're adding in, like if you look here, this RCD takes up four spaces. Some of them are after only two, like that size, but this board only has one space, right? So um, if that was a main switch doing all MCBs, you would have not had the capability of putting an RCD in there. Um, so it would be a full replacement. Um, so I, that's that's the gist of that. Um, is there anything on the ICR we have just now to let us know it's covered? Do we need a new board to fit? Or is it an add-on? Right, so I, I think I've tried to cover, it will be a case-by-case case on every EICR and every installation um, because you, you, might not have, as you, you might not have the space to fit a retrofit an RCD or there might be other factors that you need to take into consideration that um, deems it a new, a new fuse box. Um, for Robert, um, for the cost, uh, it depends on what it is. If it's the cost of a new fuse box or whatever, but um, that just varies again on the size and how much work's involved on it. But it, right now, the cost, we actually don't make a lot of money on a lot of the fuse boxes because the cost is in all of these. Um, I think we price it out. Probably Rob will tell me more. But I think we cost out like three hours labour or four hours labour. Um, the rest is literally in materials. Um, so it'd be a yeah, new tail set. I think where the, the real costs can come um, in relation to the board change, you know, as Craig touched on there, it's not actually the board change that, I mean, they're not they're not cheap. You're, you're probably starting around 400, 450 pounds upwards, but it, it's actually because we're then having to change that EICR by the consumer unit board, the fuse board, it's the rest of the changes that we have to go along with that. And um, so if there's light, lots of light switches and sockets and things that need to be tested and stuff and changed and um that that's where that's where initially it can come in um that's where it gets a, a little bit a little bit pricey um disappointing thing from our point of view is that we've been um, talking about rcds and rcbos for quite a while and any work that we've been doing um has complied to the new standard for quite a while you may find that it has not been the case um with other contractors um so you may, have, you, may, you may be thinking that work you've done recently is, is fine, but you just need to double check that. Yeah, so for Laura and uh, Kathleen, um, I'm actually going to, it's quite hard. I should have maybe got an EICR brought up on the screen from one of our systems, but um, I'll try and zoom in on, is that working? Do you want me to get one? It'll take me a few minutes. Um, I'll see if, can you see that? No. No. Um, it's just continue. trying to get a blank one. So so basically, um, like um, Robert, I know that uh, we do your stuff for you and same me, you guys at Houston. So page page one, right? On page one, where it says summary of condition 
of installation right down to the very bottom. Sometimes we put it in it and sometimes other engineers put it in. That's just giving you an overall uh, like overview of the property, or the installation in the property. And we usually put average for the year or that it's poor or it's bad or that it's good but doesn't have RCD protection. Now, on the very second page, it'll tell you in our observations if no circuits are RCD protected or some RCD protected or not all are RCD protected and it'll say a C3 against it. Um, because as I said, the repairing standard has nothing to do with the, reg the electrical regulation. So we can only put it down as a C3. Um, so I, it will be uh, mainly, Kathleen, mainly on page two, is where the recommendations will start. That's the observations and recommendations. It'll tell you there if you have full, partial, or none uh, RCD protection on the sockets. Yeah, just, um, just to reiterate that though, that, that may not be the case for other companies doing the ICRs for you. They may not be. Yeah. On that so it, obviously we, we don't, for, so Kathleen, if, when it says only one, it says um, no SPD. That basically means because there's nothing else after that, that there should be RCD protection because it's not been noted. Now, if you do go down to page uh, two, three, four, page five, where you've got the tick list, um, most EICRs should be the same as this. So 0. 0.512 of the tick list on page five, it actually says here, RCDs provided for fault protection, including RCBOs. And then if you have a C3 there, that means that um, there should be a recommendation for that. Um, if you don't have anything written down on an EICR, do we have to redo it or add on an issue for a certificate? Now, this is what's popping up quite a lot. Um, so right now we are running... Um, we are running a lot of checks for clients just now. We're actually looking at close to 4,000 EICRs or 4,000 uh, pictures of consumer units from the kind of middle of January to now. That's that's how many we've been passed on by clients. So what we are doing to them is we are looking at the ICRs for them and then corresponding them with the pictures of the fuse box to actually say if there's RCDs or not. Because... A few years ago, people would, there's no requirement to actually put any of this down. Um, so, yeah, just coming EICR. back to Gail's, Gail's question there, do I need to check 300 EICR certs? There's good news and bad news there, Gail. Um, no, you don't have to check 300 EICR certs, but you do have to check 300 um, consumer units because yeah. just checking the ICR will not give you, again, prove that you've done reasonable checks to ensure that your um, consumer units meet the new repairing standard. So um, unfortunately, the bottom line is just checking the ICR is not going to tell you whether your properties are sufficiently um, RCD protected or not. Um, yeah. So, so again, for what Robert is saying, um, effectively, yes, that answers your question, right? If 512 has been ticked, that means there is RCDs and RCBOs in the property. Now, the hard thing about that is not all companies do EICRs correctly. Um, and some of that is down to engineering uh, judgment or engineers basically not ticking or unticking the, the correct parts on the, the EICRs. So as I said, we have looked at quite a few for different clients and also um, the EICR doesn't match what's in the property because landlords or the EICR was done four or five years ago and since then it's changed landlord hands or letting agents hands or there's been work done in the property and then there's been a new fuse box added and the EICR has not been updated because there's not been a requirement because it's been in date for five years. So this is why only looking at RCDs, or sorry, only looking at EICRs is really not a fail-safe way of doing this. A picture of the fuse box, either by the tenant present just now, or if you've done an inventory or you've done an inspection, then be taking pictures. Now, I think me and, me and Laura have talked about this a bit. Um, Whenever you're sending out your property managers or you're, you're a landlord or whatever, 
this is the, the right time to be taking pictures of all your fuse boxes so that you can update your files and have a check on it. And as I said, the main things you're looking for is these test buttons, right? That test button there effectively tells you you've got an RCD. Also, this test button should be tested every three to six kind of months to make sure that it does work, because this is another thing. you just saying you have RCD protection and it doesn't work. I really don't know where we stand with that, um, if something was to happen, because, again, you've not took the right processes and checking it's actually proper and it's and it's a right RCD and is it operational. These RCBOs have the individual test buttons on it. Um, and the older style, I've got like a wee round button, but there should always be a test button for you. But as I said, if you are looking at pictures and they're not, it's not a trained eye, then if you go back to this one, where there's a lot of these, especially in East Kilbride and Cumbernauld and Coatbridge, all ex-local authority by South Lancaster Council had a contract with this manufacturer to fit all these fuse boxes. And this is a hundred milliamp. So 100 milliamp only protects you against fire and right. doesn't protect you against like earth faults or electric shock. So again, if you might have an RCD there, but it may not actually be um, suitable for um, the standard, which is 30 milliamp. So just, just so touching on, the... sorry, Fiona and you... Laura's. Um, Laura, to, to, to be honest, you know the, the amount that we're, we're, we're dealing with at the moment, um, you know, and for us to put a resource in to check every photo for every board for every client, you know, we, we manage, I don't know, but there's probably upwards of 25, 30,000 properties now per, per clients. Um, I think the solution for us is to set up um, one to one with a member of your staff for an hour with one of our technical guys, and, and they will go through exactly what it is you need to look for. Um, and then if you have specific fuse boards that you think do not meet, the standard we will review those but i think we as being realistic for us to have the resource to go through tens of thousands of photos of, of our you know fuse boards in the next couple of months it's just not gonna not gonna work but we can certainly set you up with a one-to-one -one with um, a member of our team and they will specifically talk you through um what it is you're looking for and then from there you could um, ascertain what boards we need to look at further um from there I think yeah probably I think the best so I think it's like um, initial, like we we can look at it and we will, um, but it's more about sending through hundreds and thousands at one go. I think when you whittle it down as best you can, and then go, we're kind of struggling with these ones or this one, um, and hopefully we should be able to like give a price and a, a couple of options of what to do from that picture as well. So then that, that saves us going back out um, to find your a remedy for it uh, but what warren is saying there um so the, as I, to go back in this the, the eicr means nothing at all here with um if you if you have rcds with no readings um again as long as you can prove that the rcd is there by the picture or by whatever means that you've made that you can reassure the first tier or whatever that the rcd is there present and it's working there is no need to go back and do another EICR. Um, that, but I'm not suggesting you don't do that. The, the problem is, is we don't want to use this as a way of actually making money or costing more to the landlords. We are trying to do this to best cover you guys, best cover the tenants and the landlords. So if you feel that the best way of doing this is getting another EICR done to bring it up to wherever we are just now, then we would really advise that. Um, but again, we are here to help with trying to look at pictures, trying to look at EICRs for you, trying to uh, get used to learn how to look at them, what you're looking for, and then making a the judgment after that. Um, because again, if we were to go back and do millions of EICRs, it's, it would be difficult for us to pick it all in, to get all that kind of work back in again and mm. stuff like that. But I, hey, we would love that, but we're not here to try and scaremonger you guys into doing stuff and saying we the landlords and tenants are pure all of us probably sitting here are all landlords as well um mm -hmm. so, yeah, we so Warren, we yeah Warren, on your question it, it's two different things the icr it doesn't change the you know the a pass or fail on an icr for the, the rcd protection and you would be issued with a minor work cert for the work because obviously it's work on the consumer unit 
Um, but we, there'd be no need to update the ICR. Effectively, from the repair and standard side of things, you just have to prove that you've taken reasonable steps to ensure that property has um, RCD protection. Obviously, an invoice from us to say that's the work we've done and the minor work cert would be um, would be fine. Um, and Gail, yes, we are recording this seminar. Um, so if there's any last questions on EICR, there's a couple of quick things I want to just very quickly cover over on the rest of the repair and standards. But, um, Can I just I'll answer that question for Warren, right? Um, so we, we've always took a stance of actually issuing new satisfactory EICRs when we do the work or when we do new fuse boxes rather than providing an EIC, which is an electrical and, uh, installation uh, certificate or a minor work certificate because uh, a lot of councils and a lot of uh, people do not accept this and it, because it's a, it causes a massive uh, annoyance. So we actually just provide another EICR that's satisfactory so that you don't get any comeback. Because I know me and you have talked to this one about uh, electrical uh, installation um, certificates and minor works that some councils don't actually accept it and just want another EICR. So we actually do provide that um, and we just cover ourselves in the background by having a minor works or an EIC um, in the background to, to overcome that. So we usually 90% of the time do just give you another EICR that's deemed satisfactory. Okay. So I hope that answers it. Any last questions on EICRs? Okay, we'll jump back in if there's anything else. Um, so the last two things that I just wanted to cover off um, on this, I'm just going to share that screen again. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll jump back to that in a second, Kathleen, if that's okay. Um, and the reason I'm covering this off is there's, there's two reasons. Um, essentially, it, it covers, covers you for part of the, the lead testing. Um, so this is section seven, um, and this is actually for landlords, and it helps out a little bit. Um, and essentially, I won't go into too much, but I think it's something that you want to have a look at yourself, um, the common parts and flats and tenements. Um, essentially, this goes on about the reasonless. Um, and section 7.9 will, will get quite handy for you. Um, a landlord is not required to carry out work if that requires a majority decision of all owners and the majority is not in favour of the work. So essentially saying that if your building has lead and you are not able to get them to agree to cut, to change the lead pipes, then you know that you've done everything you reasonably can there. Um, the reasonability comes in by asking the question and kind of writing a letter and saying, you know, we need to do this work. That's you know, is everyone agreeable? And more than likely, you will get at least one no. Um, so that's uh, an important factor there, and obviously that covers quite a lot of other um, things. So. Um, glad to say there is uh, at least a couple of good things within the the new legislation. Um, the second thing I'm going to talk about very, very briefly, because I don't know a lot about it, but I think it's something that will affect a lot of people, um, is the common doors um, and that the common doors must be locked. So a lot of our guys we know will go into tenement properties, etc., and the, the front door doesn't work. So that is now covered under the repair and standards. So something for you guys to maybe just be aware of that you may not have been before so have a look at that section on there as well um cool so yep yeah, i think yeah craig answered that one um so if there's no more questions guys we're going to wrap this up um thank you very much for your time if anyone has any further questions or and um, you are looking for us to do your lead testing um please do reach out as soon as possible because, as I say, we only have um, a certain amount of resource. Um, it is high, we can get through a lot of them and we will over the next two or three months, but um, you know, just to help us out, it would be good to know if you um, are going to use us and how many you have and we can arrange to get them um, sorted out for you. Um, this will be, this is, has been reported and it will be sent out um, in the next uh, day or so um and yeah if you need any further support in relation to the um, eicrs as well then yeah give us a shout and if there's no more questions we'll end the session yeah thank you everyone and speak to you all soon